this whole thing's like a movie. But if you're watching this movie with a friend, you know, this is the point where you'd lean over and say, that's not realistic. It couldn't happen in real life. And then it actually happens. I guess that's where we are in 2023 when it comes to the war in Ukraine. So inside the last 24 hours, the infamous Russian Wagner group has gone through some immediate and unplanned leadership changes. So we're going to talk about what we know as of right now. I'm recording this at 9.30 a.m. Central Time on August 24th, 2023. What this news means for the Wagner Group, the war in Ukraine, and Russia. So yesterday news came out that a plane crashed in the Tver region of Russia, which is generally west and northwest of Moscow. I'm probably, you know, probably mispronouncing that. It's spelled T-V-E-R. Uh, but pretty shortly thereafter, videos and pictures started to emerge of you know, a plane on fire, smoking, falling out of the sky, and then eventually, you know, videos and pictures of this just heap of burning rubble on the ground. Russian government agencies released the manifest from that flight or the names from that manifest saying that it was a small, uh, small jet. There were 10 people total on the aircraft that included the crew and the passenger list included Yevgeny Prigozhin, the leader of the Wagner Group, Dmitry Utkin, who's considered kind of the father or the founding member of the Wagner organization, as well as other members of the Wagner Group itself. It's not clear, you know, when you look at those others outside of Prigozhin and Utkin, how senior some of those others were. But they were all members of the Wagner Group from the reporting coming out now. The Russian government was covering this a little bit. It didn't maybe get the coverage you would expect but what I've seen as of this morning, and again, please add additional information in the comment section, help everybody better understand what's going on here because it is essentially a developing situation. But the last I saw out of this story was that Russia was able to recover eight bodies, so that's eight out of 10, from the wreckage, but they were so severely burned that they haven't yet been able to positively identify any of those, uh, any of those remains. That very well could change by the time this video comes out. In terms of what we know about what happened here, you know, honestly, there is a ton of speculation coming out from every side about the cause of the crash, who was on board, why it was done, et cetera, et cetera. But to back up a little bit, I think it's important to provide some context. Prigozhin has been leading the Wagner Group for some time now, and they were really kind of in the shadows prior to the war in Ukraine. It's kind of the idea for the Wagner Group. It's it's a state entity with a level of deniability. They kind of operated in the gray zone, and you know, pretty successfully for Russia in a lot of ways. When the war in Ukraine kicked off, Wagner ended up taking on a more direct role within essentially the Russian Ministry of Defense. They still had their own kind of area of operations that they worked within. Bakhmut famously was a majority Wagner fight, but the mask was off at that point, right? Like Wagner was getting direct, you know, in, in the case of Bakhmut, direct artillery support from the Russian Ministry of Defense. They're driving around in BMP-3s and T-90s, some of the most advanced, most modern Russian military equipment. You know, there really wasn't anybody at this point thinking that Wagner was this private standalone entity pursuing their own goals. Anyways, in the May-June timeframe of 2023, Wagner was moved off of the front and replaced with Russian Ministry of Defense Forces, which is going to be an important thing we'll come back to here in a minute. Then in June, Prigozhin staged this mutiny, I think is the best way to call it. A march on Moscow lasted about 48 hours. And it was chaotic. Nobody really knew where that thing was going to land. There were a lot of demands being uh, conveyed by Prigozhin. You know, looking back now, and I think there were some analysts that were correct at the time, it wasn't Prigozhin necessarily trying to take over Russia or, or, or oust Putin per se. The most extreme of his goals may have been to install you know, a more friendly figure at the head of the Ministry of Defense instead of Shoigu and Gerasimov. That march was interesting in a lot of ways. The, the Wagner forces took over Rossov with really no opposition. You had the civilians in the street cheering them, both when they arrived and then when they departed, and booing the state security forces when they arrived after Wagner's departure. And really, this this Wagner element, uh, and it was mixed figures, as high as 20,000, as low as three to 4,000, moving towards Moscow were really essentially unopposed, right? There, there, was, there was no real Russian ground element, be it from the army or the National Guard or police forces to stand in their way. Kadyrov, the, you know, the leader of the Chechen Republic, showed up and, and kind of positioned his troops across a bridge. But all those, that, that, that was all after, like after, after Wagner struck a deal um, to not march on Moscow. Then Kadyrov showed up and that, you know, but anyways, 
as Wagner was on the outskirts of Moscow, a deal was announced, uh, supposedly coordinated by Belarusian President Lukashenko between Putin and Prigozhin. Prigozhin would stop marching on Moscow. In exchange, they would essentially Prigozhin would get to keep the the you know ownership and leadership of the Wagner organization. He makes a ton of money through this, right? So it, it's not necessarily all ideological. Uh, this is Prigozhin's business, one of his many businesses, if you will. But it sounded like the deal was he got to keep Wagner. He wouldn't be prosecuted. He wouldn't go to jail. And he, he didn't. It didn't look like if he went to jail. He was still traveling around quite a bit. And then the, the Wagner forces that took part would be amnestied. And those that didn't take part would be absorbed in the Ministry of Defense. All of that has still kind of been playing out over the last few weeks. But this question remained of how did this random guy, Prigozhin, who's now elevated himself on social media, threaten Putin, essentially threaten Putin's grip on power? his control over the Ministry of Defense and how he's waging this war and operating you know, everything within his country. How did this random guy, Prigozhin, make that threat and, and you know, essentially threaten to use force by marching troops towards Moscow and then just, it's just forgiven? That, there were a lot of people that didn't think that's exactly how things were going to end. And that brings us into what we know today about this plane crash. I think crash is the right way to put it right now because the plane did crash into the ground. The question is maybe why did the plane crash into the ground, right? There have been some Russian media reports saying that there was a bomb of sorts tucked away in a in the landing gear or something like it's kind of a terrorist activity, something that you know you could I guess technically pin on anybody. There's also a lot of theories floating around. I think honestly probably the most prevalent is that a surface to air missile brought down this plane, which there's a lot of questions with it. That's a risky way to carry out an assassination if you're gonna do that. What if Prigozhin's not on that plane? What if you accidentally target the wrong plane? Um, what if the surface air missiles miss? And, and there's no deniability with that either, right? There's not that many people running around Russia with access to sand batteries that just are shooting down planes left and right. So it kind of narrows in who might actually be responsible for this if you know the surface air missile was used to bring down the aircraft. Now, I have seen a lot of people pouring through the pictures and videos pointing to definitive evidence that this, that, or the other thing means that it was absolutely a surface air missile as opposed to a bomb, or it was absolutely a bomb, or to be fair, I guess we have to throw this out there, that it was some sort of aircraft malfunction. Now, I haven't seen anything that is absolute conclusive evidence as to what brought the plane down as of now, as we're recording this. Uh, my personal opinion is that there are enough kind of little clues out there to make it look like this was a surface air missile that struck the aircraft. There's there's some smoke trails through the sky you can kind of see in one of the videos. Uh, there's been, you know, people, I, I, Twitter experts, I guess I'll put it on, suggesting that certain, uh, there's shrapnel that can be identified in the fuselage of the burned out aircraft. And then the plane coming down from so high up uh, and doesn't appear to be any sort of distress calls. Again, I, I don't, I'm not going to plant my flag on that and say I'm 100% confident. That's generally where I'm leaning right now. Okay, so what does this mean for the Wagner organization as a whole? And there's really a couple different ways I think this might play out. One is the idea that Wagner just got too powerful, got too uh, you know popular, if you will, um, more than Russian leadership, be it in the Ministry of Defense or out, ever wanted it to be. So not only will these fighters be moved elsewhere, be it the Ministry of Defense or just you know let go or rolled into another private military company, but the Wagner entity will no longer exist, if that makes sense. So essentially, you know, it's the idea of removing the shrine. You don't want any memories of what that thing was in the event that it could come back to be that thing once more. However, the work that Wagner does is pretty important to Russian influence all around the world. So that aspect of what they do, that's not going to go away. So it's possible that they, you know, rebrand, rename the organization, bring in some new leaders and continue their operations in places like Africa, the Middle East and Belarus. It won't look like Wagner. It'll have a totally new leadership structure, probably with a little more, you know, favorable ties to the Ministry of Defense and the Kremlin as a whole. But it would maintain the current missions and continue to operate the same way that Wagner has really since their inception. In terms of what this means for the war in Ukraine, you know, not a lot. It's a pretty similar answer to when we look back to the mutiny back in June and people were watching these, these armored columns move through Russia and say, what does this mean for the front? Is Ukraine going to take advantage and break through somewhere along the lines? And you know, it was a headache for Russia. It was something they had to deal with. I'm sure Putin didn't want to have on his plate. But because the Wagner forces have been moved off the front since the May-June timeframe, that event, that mutiny, didn't really affect operations at the front. And if you look back, there wasn't anything major that happened. Ukraine wasn't able to take advantage of, you know, a, a rift in the leadership anywhere along the front. And the same kind of holds true now. 
really since that mutiny, Wagner has not been involved in the war in Ukraine. I guess you could say they're they're technically involved with their training of Belarusian troops to the north. That border, that front really isn't very active. And the Wagner fighters up there, it's not like they're right on the front looking at Ukrainians across the uh, across some sort of no man's land. They're training Belarusian forces. So, you know, if the Wagner entity were to go away tomorrow entirely, what you see on the battlefield isn't going to drastically change in the next few days, weeks, or maybe even months. However, there is a possibility that what we've seen play out over the last 24 hours has a greater impact inside of Russia, which, you know, in turn over time would affect the war in Ukraine. So something that's not yet clear to me, and I think it's been pretty hard to really dial in on this information, is just how much support Prigozhin and Wagner have across Russia and with, you know, important people and important groups of people across Russia. I think what we've learned between the mutiny and today is that Prigozhin very well may have had some support, some high-level support inside of the Russian government, but whatever that level was, it wasn't enough, right? The mutiny was stopped. It was put down. Um, assets were seized, and now the plane appears to have been shot down with, uh, with Prigozhin and his leadership on board. In terms of popular support, it's kind of a different story. So there's a YouTube channel called 1420 that I'll link in the description below. It's great. They interview just your average Russian civilians. And I've seen some where they talk about the Wagner group and ask these you know, teenagers and young men, what do you think of the Wagner fighters? And it's almost like they're in awe. They, they talk about Wagner like you might hear teenagers here in the U.S. talk about Army Rangers or Special Forces, right? Like those are the badasses. Those are the guys getting after it. Those are the ones getting things done. And Wagner's kind of built up that mystique. So, I, you know... I think there is some fandom within Russia. I think that's safe to say, but how much? And the same applies for Prigozhin. How much of that is just, we like what they're doing. We think that's a worthwhile organization versus, you know, it's a movement that we're ready to get behind. And now that the leader is gone, we're going to take action to keep that movement type going. I haven't really seen a lot of evidence for that. And Prigozhin's also gone on these kind of publicity tours, giving cars and cash payments to the widows and parents of his fallen soldiers. And, and a lot of his rants that he's made, they appeal to the you know average Russian conscript. He's the guy out there speaking truth to power, calling Putin out, calling Shoigu out, calling out Gerasimov, saying, you're not providing what we need for our men to fight. And I think in all of that, he probably gained a lot of support from you know maybe lower levels in the Russian military, as well as civilians all across the country. You just don't you want to see that? You know, if roles were reversed, don't you want, wouldn't, wouldn't you like seeing the guy that is trying to take care of the families of the soldiers and the people that fought under his command and died? Like in, 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 in every culture, that's going to win some support. So that is out there. Now, Wagner was, was great at promoting that stuff and promoting the, you know, the civilians in Rostov that were all about Wagner being there. It's just not clear to me if that type of support is indicative of a broader level of support across Russia. I mentioned earlier that I don't think it really matters how the plane was actually brought down. What matters right now, and it'll have lasting effects, I believe, is how people think the plane was brought down, right? I mean, you know, to lean back into this, you know, assassination via surface air missile, you can place those puzzle pieces together and get from, you know, A to Z and all of a sudden Prigozhin is dead. That, that makes sense. Will people inside of Russia believe that and believe that Putin shot down a plane full of Russian citizens over Russian territory um, to, to level the score or as a power play or to reassert control over a portion of the government? Or is this just going to be kind of accepted as one of the things that happens inside of Russia? If I had to guess over the next few months, even years, this action, Prigozhin's death, even if it's proven that it was a, a Russian surface air missile ordered by Putin himself to shoot down Prigozhin's plane, I don't think that's really going to matter long term. This type of thing happens in Russia. There are high profile oligarchs, business people, politicians, opposition figures who, you know, countless numbers of them over the years that have been poisoned or fallen out of windows and nothing really changes inside of Russia. It's just kind of accepted as, you know, this is what happens. This is, this is how things operate. I think in the immediate aftermath of something like this, you know, we think it's crazy. Again, it's like a movie playing out in front of our eyes. But if you really step back and talk about powerful figures inside of Russia, all of a sudden being disappeared, jailed, or killed, you know, that's just kind of how this has happened for a long time. And, you know, my guess is that over the next few weeks, months, or years, it'll just kind of, it'll fade to the back of the memory. You know, it's just, just an, another day in Russia kind of thing.
But that's all I got for now. Again, this is a developing situation with a lot of unknowns that are probably going to remain unknown for quite a while. So if you come across any new information or information that contradicts what I said, please put it in the comment section below. Get us all up to speed on what's actually happening here. But thanks for watching. I'll see you all next time.